Dear family and friends in Christ, may the Lord richly strengthen you each day with the joy of knowing your sins are forgiven, that you are free in the gospel. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to you for the gracious gift of your Son, Christ Jesus. For it is through him, by him, that we are saved. Lord, we know this is the greatest act of love that we could ever witness. Help us each day to live out that love in our lives, to to be thankful for that love that you have shown us. Lord, may that love produce in us the good faith, good works to follow you. This we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Do not think. I don't know if you caught it, but that was the very first words that Jesus used to his hearers in our gospel reading for this morning. He started off with, do not think. Now, it's easy to skip over a small detail like that because, well, it's right at the beginning. And then we get right into the meat of the text. We've got to go right on to that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets and those before me. Except I'd like to stop there for just a moment. Do not think. See, the disciples, really the main audience of Jesus here from the Sermon on the Mount, they, they had some ideas in their mind. They were thinking some things. They had this idea that, well, Jesus, what he came to do was to lay down the law, man in manner of speaking, on the Romans. That he had come to drive out the Romans to give them freedom. They thought that that's why Jesus was there. They thought that Jesus was there to establish an earthly kingdom. They thought they knew why Jesus was going to lay down the law. They wanted Jesus to give them freedom from the Romans. Freedom they wanted instead of the freedom they needed. And the reason I stop there is because I think that sometimes we need to stop there. Sometimes in our lives, we want the freedom, well, freedom as we understand it, instead of freedom that we need, the freedom God gives us. Think about it this way. When we live our lives, when we walk our faith walk, we like to talk about the freedom we have in the gospel. In fact, I mean, we think about the, Jesus' word in John chapter 8. If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. How many of us don't like hearing those words? How many of us don't like hearing that gospel message that we are free? And yet, we're also bound. We live in a tension constantly. We're free in the gospel, but we're bound under the law. We're free to live as God's people, but we're bound by his law, by his will, by his plan for our lives. And think about this, this paradox, this tension that we live in. It's not really a comfortable one, is it? It's easy to slide one way or the other. That's how it is oftentimes with paradoxes, with tensions. It's easy to go one way or the other, but both sides lead to sin. Both sides lead to death and heresy. Let me explain what I mean here. It is certainly good to talk about our freedom in the gospel. It is certainly important that we celebrate that freedom each day, that we realize the gift of our salvation that came through Jesus Christ alone. But we don't stop there. It would be easy to say that, well, as we've been set free in the gospel, well, then we shall produce good works. We should do what we're supposed to do. But let's be honest with ourselves. Look around you. For those who are just bound by the gospel, who live according to the gospel, do they generally just do good works? And you don't have to look around you. Just think about your own life. You know the gospel, and has it produced very many good works in you? You don't have to answer out loud. And we think about this, and this freedom in the gospel is a good thing. But we can't stop there. Because when we do, it develops what's called antinomianism. And what I mean by antinomianism, this is the, this lawlessness. This is this idea that, that we can live however we want because we'll be forgiven. We justify ourselves, and this leads to licentious living. Licentious living, living apart from God's word, apart from God's love, apart from God's law. We say to ourselves, well, if I sin, God will forgive me anyway, right? We talk about other people. We gossip. We, we share juicy bits of details about other people. But it's okay because God will forgive us, right? We treat people like scum. We act rudely towards other people. We treat others as they're unworthy, undeserving. But it's okay. God will forgive me. We look at things on the television, on the Internet, We read things in books, in magazines, that we know are inappropriate. But it's okay because God will forgive me, right? I don't take time for the Lord. Or the little time I do, it's just enough time to ask God to forgive me, right? See, it starts out as maybe an innocent idea. 
just living free in the gospel. It's a great free feeling to know that we're no longer bound by the curse of the law, by the curse of our sin, but we can't just live in that freedom. Because that freedom only produces that li- licentiousness. It produces, ultimately it starts out as these innocent little sins and leads to these lives away from the Lord. These justifications that we make for ourselves are really only self-justification. They're not truly justification at all. In fact, if anything, they're mockery of God. They mock the gift that he has given us. They mock the gift that he's poured out for us. Think about it. Think about the message that it sends. If you say that God is important to me, if you say that God is an important part of my life, but it ends on Sunday morning and the rest of the week you live a different way, what message does that send to your children, to your grandchildren? What message does that send to the next generation? And this is an important thing to look at because so many times we talk about that the next generation isn't in church, that the church continues to get older and that we continue to see more gray hairs or less hairs. Well, why is that? I wonder how many times it's because of the example we set, the lives that we live. And I hope this makes you squirm a little bit in your seat because I hope as you think about the example you set, I hope that you realize The way that the law is meant to work on your life, on your heart. See, the law, it has three functions. It has three main main roles. First of all, it's to curb our sinfulness, to stop us from our temptations, to giving in to temptation. Secondly, it's meant to mirror. It's meant to show us our sins, the places we failed, the ways that we've not kept God's plan. Third, it's meant as a guide, to guide us each day, that we might follow God's plan the design for our lives. And he does have a plan and design for your life. And that's really all the law is, is God's plan for your life. It's God's desires for your life. So often we make it into this bad thing, but really that's what God's law is meant to do, is to lead us that we might live as God has designed us to live. But when we just live in the freedom of the gospel, we leave the law behind. We leave behind the plan of God. And while it's a good thing, it starts out a good thing. If we leave the law behind, we also lose that tension that keeps us in that faith walk. See, the law as a guide is meant to direct our steps every day. The law as a guide, God's word in our lives, is meant to to show us the the way we're meant to live. Now, sometimes this is where the other side of that tension, that other side of that paradox rears its ugly head. Sometimes when we get into that law, We look at that law and it starts to become, instead of a guide, a billy club. We start to force people and say, if you don't follow this law to the letter, you're doomed. Isn't that what happened to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law? Isn't that how Jesus responded to them? They were steeped in what was called legalism. They were steeped in this idea that it was all about the law, at least as they defined it. At least as they preached it and proclaimed it. And they preached that law, and they caused fear. They caused people to be afraid. And that's really what legalism does. Legalism, it may sound like a good thing. Yeah, I'm following God's law like we should. But legalism isn't about God at all. It's about us replacing God in the judgment seat and putting ourselves there. It's just as self-centered as licentiousness is. It's It's just as destructive to the faith as licentiousness is. Legalism just as much hurts people. Think about it, because you've heard it. You've seen it, you've witnessed it. We justify ourselves in these legalistic behaviors by saying, well, it's what I need to do to help someone else. People will say things like, they deserved it, because that's what legalism produces. Even Christian pastors have stood in pulpits and said, well, those Haitian people, they deserve their sin." They were not faithful to the law. They deserved the punishment they got. Some people will say, well, what about New Orleans when Katrina hit? Well, they sure deserved it, right? Isn't that what legalism produces? Or that superstorm Sandy that hit on the East Coast there, people full of greed and liberal ideologies, and they deserved that judgment that they got. And that's what legalism produces. It replaces God as the seat of judge, and it puts us there. It ignores the fact that Jeremiah, as well as Paul, said that we cannot know the heart of God, that we do not know the heart of God. But 
that we don't know the heart of others even. And yet we think that we do. We think that we can sit in that seat of judgment. But truly, like I said, legalism, it's about ourselves. It's not about caring for someone else and caring about their walk with God. Because legalism ultimately is meant to take the focus off of us. It's meant to misdirect that we don't have to look at our own sinful lives. It points that finger out there as to what other people are doing. So I don't have to look at the sinfulness of my heart. And Jesus talks about this in Matthew 7, doesn't he? Right after he, the famous phrase, do not judge, he says, remove the plank from your own eye before helping your brother with the speck in his eye. See, legalism, it's about ignoring that plank. But if we really want to honor God, to use his law appropriately, we'll first look at that plank in our eye. We'll stop for a moment and realize how significant our sin is. And it's uncomfortable, too, because when you think about our sinfulness, we realize it's not just about the sins that we remember committing, but it's about all the sins we've committed. Think about the fact that James says in James chapter 2, for whoever keeps the whole law but fails in just one point becomes accountable for all of it. We are numbered among thieves and murderers. We're among blasphemers, and we're numbered among those who reject the Lord. Jesus, he doesn't say too much different in our gospel reading for today, did he? Whoever relaxes on one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. No, it's hard to look at our own sinful lives, isn't it? It's hard because we realize how many times we've relaxed on God's command. We realize how many times we have failed to keep his law and follow his plan for our lives. And it's hard to look at our hearts. But that's where we must begin. That's where we must start, is by looking at our own hearts and looking at our own lives, realizing that this tension that we live in is a good thing, that this tension that we live in keeps us in God's path, in God's way. So often we, we go to the left, we go to the right, the legalism or the licentiousness, but when we follow this path, this tenuous tension, path of tension, we realize how God's law is meant to guide our lives. And first of all, it does point us to the gospel. It points us to our need for forgiveness. It points, us for, it points us to the fact that we have broken God's word time and again, and that it is not by us, but only by Christ Jesus. And how much we need to hear those words, I forgive you, not as the pastor speaks them, but as God speaks them to us. It, and, it is, and that is why we realize how often we need to take the sacrament, receive the gift of Christ's forgiveness through his body and blood but also knowing that that freedom does not free us to mock God, but frees us instead to live according to his plan, to live according to his will in our lives, to live out each day not freed from the law, but freed to live the law, freed to live as his people, freed to care for others and love others as he has loved us. That's why that tension is there. And I know it doesn't exactly fit in the way in our minds. It doesn't exactly fit in the way that we would define the Christian walk. But that's why we started off with don't think. Don't think that you know that your sinful heart or your sinful mind is going to know better than Christ. But instead look at what Christ, the example he set. He did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. To fulfill the law that we could not keep. So that we would one day have true freedom with him forever. Because that is the hope and promise that we live for each day. That is the promise that we live for even as we live this earth knowing that time and again we fail, knowing that he gives us a promise that he will give us eternal life because of his death on the cross. Truly that is the freedom we look forward to. That is the freedom of the gospel, knowing that we will be in, in eternal life with our Lord. May you live each day freed by the gospel to live out God's plan in your life. Amen. Please pray with me. Lord, so often as we live our lives, we live them in the midst of these tensions and these paradoxes, freed from the gospel but bound in the law. Lord, help us each day instead of trying to understand it as, as our earthly minds and our, our earthly hearts would lead us to, to turn to your word, 
to know that it is your guide and your direction for us, to know that, that you have given us this freedom in the gospel, this forgiveness of sins, so that we might go about as your people living out our lives faithful to your word. Lord, let us not just merely look at your laws, ten commandments that have been written down, a, a list of rules to follow, but instead help us to see it as your will and your plan for our lives, your guidance and direction. Lord, let us not turn to that law as a billy club, beating up others until they submit. Let us instead see it as that gentle guide, that direction for us each day. Forgive us for those times when we do abuse your law, for those times when we ignore your law. Reassure us that we are set free by the blood of your Son, Christ Jesus, who gave his life for us on the cross, who now lives and reigns with you, who will one day return to call all his people home. So it is in Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen.